morning just give it a couple more minutes or a few more minutes so get some more people to join Okay, I pasted the link to the notes, so, so please add yourself as an attendee. Right, so it's 802, almost 803. So thank you everyone for joining. So um, today we have uh, Southern Core and the project and Clive is here. And thank you for uh, deciding to uh, show us the, the project and what it's all about. And 
I'm excited to learn about it. Um, I think uh, this is probably the first uh, AI machine learning type of project that has presented presented in SIG runtime. So we're pretty excited about it. Um, yeah, so um, go ahead and take it away. All right, cool. Yeah, great. I'll uh, share my screen if I can. Let's see. Cool. Uh, let me see if I can move this. Cool. Can you see that? Yeah. All right, cool. So great to see you. So I'm, I'm uh, Clive, I'm CTO of Selden. Um, so I'm just going to give you an introduction to some of the projects that we work on and yeah, it'd be good to get your feedback and see how it connects to the things that you're interested in. That would be, that would be an interesting thing for me. Great. Um, so I'm just going to go through some sort of rationales of what Selden's trying to do, sort of set, set, set the sort of landscape. Um, uh, so one of the things is uh, this paper from Google uh, from 2015. Uh, which is really setting the scene for what we, we were trying to do, um, which they're saying, you know, when you do ML code, you know, the data scientists sometimes think, or, or even the whole organization thinks it's just, you just got to write your little algorithm and that's it. But actually, there's a whole set of other things surrounding it. And this was a paper by Google from their own in internal analysis. And some of you might know it's got quite a lot of uh, fame afterwards, um, where the size of the boxes are the amount of code they had to write for these other things surrounding the ML code. So there's a lot of technical debt that gets uh, created in an organization and real seldom that was sort of inspired us to uh, um, start doing what we're doing is that we wanted to solve those parts of the technical debt in terms of serving infrastructure, analysis tools, um, and uh, monitoring of your machine learning, et cetera. And so really help our organizations in that area. We've seen a trend um, in recent years that the organizations are looking for best of breed um, parts for the whole um, so ML life cycle, you know, from initial data um, analysis and um, um, through to the training and then the serving. And um, uh, so that's, that's really the direction we see that's taking. Obviously, also with the cloud native world and, and tools fitting into that. And we'll, we'll discuss that a, a little bit. Um, so that, that's one of the rationales for Seldon to help organizations in that area for these, these things with their ML code. So their data scientists can fo focus on that part, uh, the core ML uh, code part. Um, so another way of looking at what we do and, and sort of the issues uh, that we find uh, in organizations is one, you, you have the data scientists on one side and they've got their own set of tools that they know a lot about, you know, obviously all the training tools and TensorFlow and video and Spark, et cetera. And then you've got on the other side, you've got the DevOps who've got their own tools in the cloud native world and all the tools they want work out well. And there really is sort of quite a hard divide between the two, the data scientists don't really care sometimes too much about the DevOps, what the DevOps are doing and the DevOps are, uh, scared about the machine learning and all this, this stuff, which they don't really understand. It's not so simple as, as a normal app they're going to just deploy onto their Kubernetes cluster. And so you, you really get this um, issue of, 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 of these two teams working together. And that's also what we're trying to help, trying to put some DevOps into data science and data science, help them move their stuff out so they can get it into production to really speed up that time to get those uh, machine learning projects from just being a project out into production and making a difference for um, companies and organizations. So that's, 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 that's another rationale. And then this one obviously should make a lot of sense to you guys. Um, this is, you know, we're saying nothing new that, you know, a person as a data scientist, they've got toolkits. They want to really deploy their model, scale and update it, uh, you know, onto a compute cluster with CPUs, GPUs, and TPUs. And obviously we all, all know about the um, sort of stack that's been built up over the years from the container run times. But then obviously Kubernetes coming in to orchestrate uh, more complex projects on top of those container run times. And then projects such as Istio for the service meshes, which allow you to do all the things that, that that allows you to do in terms of handling that sort of network management. Uh, and then interesting projects like Knative and other ones to really build on top of that for serverless. And there's that, there's that sort of gap in between that and what the data scientists need to do. And so really uh, the issue is if you wanted to use that stack, um, you've got all those things that, that I think we all know about it, but data scientists are, are probably less interested in. So I'm not going to go through the big list as I think it's all, we'll all be um, sort of familiar as well as sort of, um, sort of Kubernetes, um, um, like aficionados uh, here, but um, you know, it's quite a challenge uh, for people to do that as data scientists or as sort of companies to get all these things when they're trying to get their, their machine learning out of the stack. So really sort of sell them what we're trying to do here is with our projects, sell them core and KF serving, uh, is to build on this stack and sort of to bridge that gap to allow data scientists to uh, sort of focus tool, which is sort of cloud native and allows them to get their machine learning into production. So that's, that's another rationale for us. And then 
one of the last things is also very important to us is, is the whole um, um, sort of ethical side. So obviously there's a lot of interest in society of how AI is going to be used when it's put into production. Um, and so that has built up a lot of momentum and it's obviously key to, to, uh, for, for all the projects and companies that started to use AI and apply it to their customer bases. And then there's now beginning to be a lot of regulation in certain areas, you know, so GDPR in, in, in Europe and, and other, and other um, so regulations coming in which need to be applied and trying to build up some sort of rules uh, for how AI can be applied. But there's really still, there's still a space of how that is actually going to be, how companies need to apply those regulations and what is the best practice when you actually put your machine learning in production, how do you know that it's actually um, not harming your user base and you know, it's really doing what it says and, and can be audited, et cetera. And so there's a gap there and that's also what we're trying to fill with some other tech. So, so obviously still this space is really emerging, you know, from how society is reacting at the base to AI as it, as it, as it affects them more. And then in the middle layer of companies and um, regulations being applied and how that's working out, I think that's still being worked out you know, how that's going to apply and then the tools at the top. But it's a space that, that we're in and we're, we're trying to also help out, help out there. And then finally, I just wanted to bring up one more sort of academic side is that, um, so obviously there's, there's some really big conferences every year on machine learning. One of the biggest is ICML. Um, and the first time, this is the first time they had like a um, workshop, uh, ICML, on challenges in deploying and uh, monitoring machine learning systems. Um, so it's really being viewed also in the um, academic world, what are the challenges uh, when you try to put machine learning into production? And we actually were lucky enough to get two talks into that workshop, uh, one on serverless inferencing on Kubernetes uh, by myself, and then there was another talk on the work we're doing in Alibi for um, some monitoring and explainability of models in production. And there's a lot of research areas that are being applied in this area of you know, what are challenges when you're actually deploying machine learning models. So I just wanted to sort of highlight that as a, an emerging area that's coming also from academia with a lot of research being done. Um, so, okay, that's sort of, that's the background. So I hope you understand what we're trying to solve at Selden and what's the projects that we actually um, work on to help to achieve some of those uh, goals. Uh, this is our stack of projects that we work on. Um, so starting in the layer in the middle, so this is all open source in the middle. Um, so the Selden Core, which is probably the most mature project, probably have four or five years maybe, I, I can't remember now, but it's got a lot of traction. That's, I'll go into it into more detail, but that's providing it like a abstraction a, a custom resource to allow you to define um, how you want to put your machine learning model and or a um, whole inference graph out into production, managing it, updating it, scaling it, et cetera. And then more recently, we've in the last year or so, we've been working with a group of companies on KF serving, which is building, has very similar aims. It was building on the stack of Knative. So looking at serverless, how can serverless help uh, in the area of machine learning deployment? Um, so those, that's sort of the middle layer. And then I, and like the bottom there, which feeds into that middle layer, a suite of projects that we've been working on to focus on some of the um, things you need to do once you've got your model out, which is obviously the core concern for uh, um, a company, but um, sort of creating a data science model and putting it out there, then the things that surround it. So things like um, explanations, um, you know, why is the actual model giving the response it, it, it's actually given and try to understand that uh, for the various stakeholders, be it customers, be it auditors, or, or the actual data scientists themselves who want to understand what, how the model is behaving. So I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about that. And then we have another project called Alibi Detect, uh, which is uh, focusing on the ways you need to monitor models when you put them into production. So things like drift detection, outlier detection, um, things like um, adversarial detection and stuff like that. And these feed, this is also open source, you can find them, I'll, I'll give links to them um, uh, on uh, GitHub and these feed into and then these projects above to actually allow you to actually deploy those models on Kubernetes and add these techniques surrounding your model. And then at the top, obviously, it's a company we need to make money. We have um, a project which is our core enterprise project, which is bringing this all together for companies to provide a full enterprise stack uh, for machine learning, bringing in all this open source, we're like an open core company and feeding it in and then providing a full solution so companies can scale. Uh, and manage their models. I'll, I'll give a quick glimpse of that at the end. Obviously, I'll focus more on the, uh, the open source. So going to a bit more detail on some of those projects. So we have Seldon Core. So what is that trying to do? That's uh, basically allowing you to build up a whole graph of, of um, containerized components that are doing inference and put them together, allow them to be reusable in the different projects and then um, manage that for you. Uh, so that graph is um, defined by a uh, custom resource. So we have our own operator that's, that's, that's running that and you define by that custom resource the various components, uh, various customizations you want, you know, in terms of pod customizations and what the model is, 
um, you know, what type of model it is and, and how you want it to actually connect together. So you might define a, just a single model in your inference graph or you might have much more complex things. So we have customers, for instance, doing large inference graphs with um, things like multi-arm bandits, which, which decide in real time based on the input traffic, which of the underlying models uh, this particular request will go to. So you might add that in with a, a suite of different models and then you might tie in further things earlier in the um, so inference chain uh, maybe some feature transformation that needs to be done before the, actual, the request gets the model, maybe some transformations that need to be done after the request has come back from the model, and then adding in other things like I discussed, like outlier detection and explanation. So basically we allow you to define this whole graph in uh, YAML, obviously YAML JSON as a custom resource and then deploy it and then manage it and update it. So that really handles the core thing of what data scientists want to do, uh, deploy, scale, and update their model. And, and, the, and they do that by updating their custom resource um, um, with, with the various definitions. Then, but then the, the next question I suppose is how do they get the core components uh, to actually derive these sort of containerized boxes in their inference graph? And there's really two ways that we provide. One is sort of out of the box uh, machine learning servers. So all they need to do is say, okay, here's my artifact on S3 or uh, Google storage. And then we'll fire up a, say, TensorFlow serving or a Triton server you know, for that artifact and manage it and um, tie it all into the inference graph so that the actual API can be used through that. That's one way, and that's very popular. That's obviously the most simplest way that they, they can use uh, sell them once they've uh, trained a model and got that artifact onto some location, either on the cluster, as I say, or in the cloud in, in some bucket. And then the other way, which is surprisingly actually quite popular as well, um, with lots of organizations is if we have, we have um, particular language SDKs. So in different languages, if you have custom code and what we allow is the data scientists just to focus on the prediction code. So say in Python, we have a Python wrapper as we call it, and they can just focus on the predict call of the Python wrapper and maybe some other stuff to set up their model at the start. And then we'll manage that in terms of wrapping it up into a, um, so a microservice, allow them to um, um, containerize it, add in the metrics, uh, the tracing, and other, other parts um, so it can easily be slotted in here as part of the inference graph and that's, and that's actually quite popular with a lot of our customers who have like custom code in different languages we have people using java some people using r there's actually a, a talk at the last kubecon europe about uh guys from nasdaq um, using seldon core and they've got some um, models in r and so we have various language wrappers and uh, that allow you to wrap up your code uh, so a lot of the data science just to focus on the machine learning code and then put it into the graph I have a question. So, sure. um, yeah, uh, you mentioned the models on the right side, um, and they can be like uh, artifacts in, in S3. But once those models yeah. are created, the models are created, they are, are they loaded on, on into memory or some other place where the inference actually can happen faster, or or is it, it is it still in S3, or is it still or like maybe um, EBS storage or and maybe typically some of these models may be kind of kind of large, right? So, yeah, absolutely. That is a, a quite a good point. So, what what we allow them to do, what we allow people to do is define a um, location where it's from, as you say, S3, and then the actual model server will download the model from S3 onto the local volume and then run it in memory. Um, so, there is still work to be done in terms of very large organizations that maybe have lots of um, using the same model from different locations, how you can use caching, and we're looking into that sort of caching layer that's, that sits between um, uh, so S3 and the actual local model server, which will have the model in memory. Um, but at, at present, we provide um, sort of uh, standard downloaders, like a, a um, so init container that runs. So once the model server starts up, it has the init container is given the location of the model, um, and it understands how to talk to S3 or um, GCS, etc., and then it downloads it locally, and then the server starts in the main pod um, and reads from that um, sort of local volume and, and reads the model into uh, sort got of memory. Yeah. Okay. Got, it. got it, cool. Thank you. Cool. Question. And so one other thing we add as part of what we do is, is a um, service orchestrator. So obviously you just define this graph and you don't need to um, decide how, how this graph connects together. We, sorry, that's not right. You can define how the graph connects together, but, but, but we'll manage the sort of request and response flow uh, sort of through the graph. So we add in a component which you don't see here, which is a surface orchestrator, which is going to take the request and manage that flow. It's going to say, okay, first I need to call, say, the feature transformer. And then once the response comes back for that, they've defined this to go to a multi arm bandit and I'll send the response to that. And then the multi arm bandit says, okay, I want to send to, say, model A. And um, in this case, so I'll send the model, 
the request to model A, the model A responds, and then it will send it back through out the graph. So that's a, an extra component, a sort of sidecar uh, that we add in uh, to the graphs. But apart from that, they've got complete flexibility, so they can define parts of these to be in certain pods that scale in a, in a sort of different way. So to say the feature transformations could have like an HPA uh, that scales in one way, and, uh, and the models can be on like another um, pod that's, that's going to scale on a um, sort of different metric. So you've got a lot of flexibility in how you define it as well. Um, and then in terms of how people use it, so in terms of what we've done and in terms of our sort of life cycle, we've focused initially more on sort of RPC use cases, so real-time uh, machine learning inference, um, and that's probably how most of our customers um, come to us and use us at present. But we're also, uh, what we're seeing is customers do want like a unified solution. So once they've created their model, they don't just want to expose it via RPC, they want to also um, send a sort of batch request to it or, or use a streaming via, say, Kafka or Knative, um, and, all, and send that. So we allow them to do all three, basically. Um, and it's, so it's very easy to use the same components um, irrespective of how they're going to sort of consume that model in their organization. Um, so, so that's uh, Seldon Core. And I'll just go on if there's no questions. Hey, Diane? Sorry. Yeah, Diane, I'm asking yeah. a question. I don't yeah, know if you yeah. can hear me, though. Oh, sorry. It's a bit, yeah. it's a bit low, yeah. your volume. But yeah, I, I yeah, can hear you. You mentioned something about containerization of their model initially, is that part of what you provide as well? Or do they, they are assumed to have used S2I or whatever when they start? Yeah, so that's a, um, it's also a good question. So we provide in our docs is examples of how to use S2I and we, we have actually S2I builder to, to allow them to easily use S2I that brings in the appropriate uh, sort of dependencies, say in Python and stuff to actually wrap their model easily. But we also provide them um, docs for how they can just use a standard uh, so Docker file to actually um, create their model. And we have people using different methods. So obviously not everybody wants to use this S2I. There's, you know, some people like it, some people don't. And there's obviously many ways of building their containers. We want to be quite agnostic to that. So yeah, there's not like a unified solution as that we provide them with different sort of resources to really um, create their container in the way that they want to. Okay, I was just trying to figure out the scope of it. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, so that's sold and core. Cool. So uh, as I said, there's another um, area that we work on, which is uh, sort of looking at things you need to surround your model with. And that's two projects that we work on. Um, um, one is Alibi Explain and one Alibi Detect. So Alibi Explain is looking at um, so explanations. Uh, so looking at um, once your model is out there, um, how, you, how if you get a particular prediction back, why did the model give the actual predict prediction? We have different techniques for this, both black box and white box. So black box has the advantage, it just pr purely treats the model as it says, as a black box, and you just um, talk to the model over an API. So, it, so the big advantage of that is you don't, you don't care how it was created, what technique, it could be like a deep neural network, it could be like a tree-based model, it could be just a sort of simple linear regression. It doesn't matter, because all the um, techniques do is just query the model many, many times, normally by changing some of the inputs from the um, um, like initial input, and trying to understand how the model is actually responding to those slight, slight changes in the input. And from that, it builds up a picture of, how, of what the model is taking into consideration, and then it can give like a human understandable response. And so that has a lot of in, um, interest, and in, especially in sort of organizations who want to keep it quite separate. So the team that, say, built the model, they can keep it completely separate from the team that needs to explain it. It, it is obviously also more challenging, though, because it's tr treating, as I said, purely as a black box. So you're just talking over an API. To it. So we also have white box explanations, which is focused on if you know how the model was created. So you actually have access to the model weights. And you know, if it's in your network, you have access to the Keras uh, saved model. Then you can load that saved Keras model, and then you can look at the weights and you can do analysis of that. Again, probably um, doing various techniques to actually understand how it's working. Or if you've got like a tree-based model, you can actually load that tree-based model and try to understand it and give an explanation for this predict particular prediction. So each, each, of, each has the, both their pros and cons, and it's not like a, a, a single way to do it. And also, just to quickly jump into the Alibi uh, project, um, just to illustrate the sort of different ways of looking at it, that we have a large number of different state-of-the-art techniques. And, and, the, and the key thing is those techniques give different ways of viewing those explanations. Also, they have different focuses on the type of input data. So it could be that some techniques work with classification, actually most of them here work with classification, but some are more focused on regression, and also some are more focused on certain types of input data. So if your data is just tabular, um, then fine. And also if it has sort of categorical variables, you know, is it um, uh, some work better or worse with that? 
somewhat fo are focused more on text, some on images, um, and, and other features like that. So the, there's not really one uh, way of solving the explanation question in terms of machine learning models. And also the way these give these models give their responses is also uh, quite different. And so some are suited more for data scientists, uh, where say some like sort of counterfactuals are maybe suited more for the actual customer. So for example, counterfactuals would tell you what do you really need to change. So if you have like a loan system, say that's sort of rejected your loan, it's like an automated system. And if you use the counterfactual um, so explanation technique, then it could tell you what do you as a customer need to change for this system to change its mind and actually give you the actual loan. And so it's easier to understand that way, whereas other techniques might help the actual data scientists understand what features are being taken into account in terms of how the models. Are. So they all have their pros and cons, um, and we need to work with the organization uh, concerned into which one would be most appropriate for the, uh, the actual models being put out. Um, this is also quite an active research area and which we, and also the other challenge is that it's also quite complex so you need to train some of these on the actual training data um, so even though some of them are black box so they don't care about what technique you use to train your model some of them need to understand the training data so if they're going to actually uh, sort of perturb the input then they need to know say if it's an age if this feature is an age then it only makes sense to sort of perturb it between say uh, one and 110 or something there's no point putting in the value of 1000 and seeing how the model behaves because it's going to give you strange results so there's certain you know uh things you need to look at in terms of that i have a question so yeah this is very interesting so mm -hmm. um uh do you actually integrate with some of the graphing tools i would imagine like some people want to understand you know so about how these models actually behave so for example like something like tableau right so people want to see how people are using the model or, or, or how or how it's um, making its decisions, right? So. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. I think there is quite a challenge there. I mean, so one of the large challenges in sort of explanations is really how you show that data to the user and how, how you tie it back into, into the, how the actual model is being used. And actually maybe I can, quickly sort of dip into our enterprise product just to show you the explanations in action. Hopefully I can just give a quick demo. So this is one model. This is our like our top level viewing panel of cell and deploy, which shows the different models you've got running. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Obviously we're, fo we're focusing more on the open source, but, but this will help hopefully answer your question. So I've got one model here, which is a sort of income sort of loan categorization uh, model, uh, which is based on making predictions uh, based on sort of demographic features is actually a standard um, sort of data set uh, we have. Um, it's actually taken from the US census in 1996. Um, it's a standard open data set. So we've got various demographic features, features and it will, it will predict whether the person's going to have high or low income. Um, so we can take a, a particular example, uh, send it to the model. So it's, it's a, like a binary classifier. So it's saying this person uh, 86% chance of having low income. And because we've added a, an explainer um, to this model, it can basically um, try to investigate that model and, and understand why. So this is using a technique called anchors. So we've got the core demographic features here. And basically this is um, um, showing that this model is quite focused on two. It's saying marital status separated and sex equals female. So it's saying 95% of the time, if you just had those two features, the model would predict low income. So obviously this is key, because this is saying, well, is this acceptable to put this model out? Because this looks like it's quite biased in terms of um, gender. And so it, it may be that you, this is completely unacceptable to put this model out. You need to get more, or it, it may be that you need to get more data for uh, various sections of your model. So, I mean, this technique anchors, which is the technique I'm showing here, really gives you the core anchors that the model is using. Uh, you can set a threshold, in, in this case, it's 90%. So it tries to look for features. Obviously, there's a lot of features here. You know, there's features on what is white collared, uh, the race and other things, where they are, United States, their age and other things like that. And it's trying to find core features that, um, from that initial request that we're trying to explain that really made the model go in one direction. And here it's, it seems to be mostly marital status, um, but because you set the, uh, the confidence to be at least 90% of the time, it should be true, this answer, this explanation, then it, tried to, it, it, it went further and tried to find one more feature, which in this case was the gender feature. So um, what is the underlying model here? Is it you know random forest? Is it linear regression? How do we see that? Yeah, this, yeah, this model is actually just a very simple, I think it's um, so linear regression. 
And this technique is black box, so it, it doesn't actually, as I say, depend on the actual underlying uh, model, but it's, it's, a, it's a very simple model just to illustrate that it's quite biased. And actually this data set um, from uh, the census data is actually very um, sort of unbalanced. There's actually only 1% um, of people who have, who have high income. So most people have low income in their data set. So it, it produces very biased values. This is why we're using it as sort of illustration of the things you need to do to, of how you can use explanations and, and it can help you understand your model more and then obviously get early indicators of some of these things. Okay, so like if you had linear regression and you were asking for a year that's outside the model, it might tell you, look, this is outside the range and so for the linear regression is invalid or something like that. Um, yeah, I, mean, I suppose that's, I mean, that's slightly related. Actually, this technique is actually needs to ha have access to the training data so it can understand the range of, I think this is the, I'm not sure which one is the age, age thing, but, uh, but it needs to understand that if it say in what it was doing, it, it would have probably send several hundred requests to the model and it would probably change this feature a little bit. So do 65, you know, 55 and stuff. So it needs to know that it's, there's no point doing 600 because that's going to give, you know, strange results uh, won't help the explanation. So it, it sort of understands those aspects of the actual training data and then it fires off lots of requests to get this answer. Okay, so it's not really rule based of, uh oh, you're doing linear regression in the wrong way or something. It's not going to tell you. Yeah, no, it, it, it's not like that. It's really just, as I say, treating the model as a black box and trying to understand uh, by, by um, uh, understanding how the model is behaving just around this particular value. So it's changing features and seeing if, if the model changes its opinion and um, what are the core things that make it focus on that result. Very cool. Yeah, 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 it's, it's a cool set of techniques. And so here down here, we just give access to the actual training data sets. You can see examples which actually fit that explanation. And then I, there should also be some examples which don't fit that. So that these are people who have those features, separated and female, uh, but have high income. And so you can see, okay, maybe I need to expand out my training set by getting more of these um, you know, to sort of label these and stuff. And, you know, it, it just helps the data scientists. This technique is obviously, as I said, you need to be very understanding of the actual stakeholder uh, that needs to look at this. If you gave this to a customer, it would probably be very confusing to them. So this is a technique that's probably more focused on the data scientists or maybe the auditor, uh, as opposed to some of the other techniques. Yeah, just one comment. I think this is a great feature. I mean, some of the, the things that I've been hearing about some of the models is, is that they're biased and this is a great mm. way to see that um, uh, you know they're biased and they're maybe telling some of the data scientists that they need to change their models right or they, they need to in, in a certain way so they, they are less biased right? so. yeah absolutely so it, it, it can be used at various different stages of the machine life cycle so it can be used in sort of development and sort of so auditing but also obviously in production as well that you know you might get a request maybe this has gone live and someone's saying, hey, why was I, you know, rejected, uh, you know, for a loan? And then we can say, oh, oh, look, this is, these are the reasons the model's looking at, you know. And so, you know, you can get early, get early warning of that. Um, so I'll, I'll just show you one more. This is like a different model. This is a sort of text-based explanation. So this is a model that takes um, some movie uh, reviews and tries to decide whether it's um, sort of positive or, or a negative sentiment. So hopefully I can find an example and I'll predict and then I'll explain that example um, and we can have a look at it. So this is a movie review, it's a visually exquisite but narratively opaque and emotionally vapid experience of style and mystification. So obviously that's uh, some negative. <laughs> and um, so what this explanation here in the text thing is saying, what are the words that the model was looking at to really make this sort of negative? And obviously it's high highlighting these two emotionally vapid <laughs> as the two core things. So. It, it sort of shows like another angle that, that you need to have different explanation techniques for different types of data and, and how those work for different types of data well, it should be different. So, you know, so obviously this is different, you know, to the tabular case and it's sort of highlighting things in like a different way, but it's actually using the same sort of technique, but um, for text-based data rather than um, sort of tabular. So this is sort of anchor text as it's called rather than anchor tabular uh, technique. Uh, cool. So yeah, so that's um, Alibi Explain. And then we also have Alibi Detect, which is looking at um, sort of more the monitoring side. So looking at outliers, obviously, because you don't want to actually give um, responses from your model if it's an actual outlier, because you, you know, it's quite likely the model is going to give a very strange results. So if you have an outlier, you, know, you, sh you should probably throw that uh, result away from the model. Then other things like um, adversarial attack detectors. Um, that's also an area that we do research on. 
obviously it's quite a niche uh, um, uh, there's you know obviously particular areas that it's important for um, this is an example taken you know from sort of um, a traffic sign detector so this is a classic one you know where you've got a stop sign here and the model saying stop great but if you just attack it in certain ways by adding a few pixels it's still pretty much looks like a stop sign to us but actually the model gives a completely different answer and the same for these other traffic signs um, always wondered whether stop sign was blue i think it's it's like taken from a german data set and i'm sure maybe stop signs are blue in germany i'm not sure um so yes yeah, so that's stop the use of the, they're in german so. <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> yeah so so, yeah, so that's um we, we do that we also look at things like drift detectors which tell you when do i need to retrain my model so it's the input distribution the model seeing completely different to what it was trained on because again you, it's probably going to be giving bad answers you probably need to retrain it on on the new type of data and it's the same sort of thing so this is the other way detector uh, github repo and again we there's a suite of different uh, techniques again based on some of the different um sort of uh, modalities and, and sort of decision points you know is it is your data tabular image time series text does it doesn't have categorical features you know do you want to do online outlier detection or do you want to have outliers at the particular feature level you know so for like a sort of image the feature level will be sort of the level of pixels rather than the whole image as you need to make decisions based on that and similar for the other sort of things adversarial detection and uh, a sort of drift detection that's obviously the key is that we, we we do this data science then we bring it back into Selden core so you can then deploy your model using Selden core and then you can add these explainers etc explain as outlier textures to your model to give the things surrounding it and that's obviously the goal to allow organ allow um, organizations to do that um, so cool so i'll go on to another project we work on which is care of serving so this is like focused on using some of the things from say k native so we're focusing on scale to zero because obviously you know things like uh, gpus and other aspects of machine learning inference are quite costly so if you if it's if you've got the model and it's not being used wouldn't it be great just to get rid of the infrastructure from your kubernetes cluster so i mean it's really great stuff they're doing k-native and so this is building on top of that and everything is we're looking at gpu auto scaling in this project because actually gpu auto scaling is, is quite a challenge I'll, i think i'll talk about it in the, in the next slide just how that how k-native solves that and also what we're trying to do we actually founded this project with uh, some very large partners google bloomberg microsoft and ibm and we're trying to really create some standards for machine learning inference and feed them across the whole industry so one of the things we've done is is created like a standard protocol for machine learning inference and we're starting to get people from these organizations to actually buy into actually using it. Um, so it's obviously that takes time as all standards do, but um, it's, it's an interesting direction as part of what the project was created for. Um, so this project is part of Qflow. So Qflow, is, I'm sure you've heard of it, but it's like a sort of it's an ecosystem of, of, sort of machine learning projects, right from sort of, sort of data analysis, training at scale, and sort of hyperparameter optimization and serving. And so there's part of that. So it's, it's like a great um, sort of, a location to join together with these other projects in this ecosystem to work on machine learning on top of Kubernetes. Um, so just focusing one thing in care of serving that we, we solve. So one thing that's really difficult is GPU auto scaling. Why is it difficult? Because when you've got GPU um, so models using GPUs, you've got various metrics. You'll have metrics from the actual server using the CPU and you'll have metrics from the actual GPU itself. And also those GPU metrics are sometimes hard to um, get from your Kubernetes cluster and it's also then hard to combine all those into a single rule if you want to do auto scaling and if you want to say okay if my CPU or my server gets over this amount and my uh, so GPU uh, stats say this then I scale up and it, it's actually quite hard for people to do so um, so luckily we can simplify that by using the uh, ideas from Knative which just are going to basically look at the number of in-flight requests going to your actual um, pods in this case machine learning but obviously Knative is quite um, so generic so all you have to do is say what for these pods um what is the amount of um, concurrent requests they can manage maybe this model server can handle 10 requests or maybe it's just one and so basically knative takes that into account it actually uses um, various sidecars and stuff it puts in like queue proxies to understand how many requests are in flight and then from that it can take those stats from that and how many requests are coming in uh, to actually decide should i should i scale up or should i scale down and so it makes it much easier for the actual user in terms of machine learning uh, who sits at the top who just wants to have their thing scale automatically not really to do much all they need to do is say how many requests can i serve my actual model server serve at the same time and it really solves that and obviously there's some other great things in k-native that if like there's a burst of requests 
then they get stored in a component called the activator before they get pushed on to the actual uh, replicas when they've scaled up so you don't get like too many requests hitting your model at the same time. So it's really interesting and we're trying to build on top of that technology um, for machine learning inference. One question here is, um, so when it comes to handling many, many requests, we're talking about million, millions of requests. So, uh, so the standard practice is to keep uh, uh, share storage, you know, for these for these pods, or you know, so they can they can actually do the serving from that storage. I mean, if you if you have a really big model, mm -hmm. because spinning up. Uh, pods for every single request and then creating a, uh, you know, models in storage for the model, you know, every, for every single pod, then we take a lot of time, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a very good point. You've actually, I don't think I have it on these uh, slides, but um, I gave a talk at the um, so ICML on just on KF serving. And so one of the slides was the challenges presently with, with using it. And that is exactly what you said. <laughs> the challenges are that once you scale up, you've got that big lag time. So you've got all your requests waiting for this replica to start. And so, yeah, I mean, that is a, a clear challenge. And actually even some people, if um, so at, at the moment, the way to solve that is, is to, um, uh, well, there's not really many ways at present of, of to solve that, but one is to have your model locally. So it doesn't have to be downloaded. So at least you get rid of some of the network time, but, but even then you, you're still gonna have time for the model server to start up. Um, or the other, thing, the other thing people do is just to get rid of the um, scale to zero and just say, okay, I want to have at least a certain number of replicas, but then that's obviously getting rid of the whole point of K-Native. So yeah, it's definitely an open challenge. Um, and that is something we're actually looking at as, as part of care serving or so with the K-Native community, you know, how can that be solved? Yeah, got it. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so you, you put your, your, your finger on the, uh, one of the key points. Uh, cool. Um, so yeah, so... I, I've sort of showed you Cell Deploy, which is our sort of closed source uh, architecture, and that's really bringing everything together. So it's 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 allowing you to use core and KF serving, and Alibi explain and detect, and tying it all up with standard components. Uh, things like uh, you, you know, so things like GitOps, which we're like a big believer in. Um, so which, if you don't know, I'm sure you do that everything gets stored onto source control before it's, it's put onto the cluster. So you've got your sort of declarative representations. You know, as you define a model. In deploy gets pushed out to GitHub or Bitbucket, comes back on using things like Argo CD, um, which really allows you to give that full audit trail, stuff like that. And we tie it together with um, you know metrics and Elastic Stack and and off levels with Dex and Key Cloak tying into LDAP and we give it enterprise API. So that's how we tie everything together for our, like uh, so enterprise customers. And obviously that's quite key. So like you know in terms of um, some of the models, I've got like a model running here. Um, you get all the stats, but the, but the key thing is just to highlight the uh, this GitOps. You've got that full, um, you can go to uh, see what all, all the actual actions you've done on the model. Because it's all stored in, in GitHub, every, everything that you did, so you, all the canaries you created or other ways updated, and you can see what's the difference between that and any um, sort of documentation. And obviously, if you feel there's a mistake, you can go back to a particular point in the sort of chain of, of your GitHub repo and just restore to that state if you wish. So it really allows to do that. So yeah, that's what we're really doing. Um, cool. So that's the enterprise product. And uh, that's pretty much my last slide. Uh, I just wanted to finish on some uh, things for the future and things which may interest you. I'm not sure, but um, so some I things which have come. Yeah. The last slide, sorry, the one that had Argo in it. Yeah. If someone is already using Tecton, you know, instead of Argo, can they, should they just use, and they wanted to use Selden, would they, have Argo and Selden on their system, or like, can you replace Argo in that picture with Tecton? Yeah, this is um, so actually something slightly different. This is um, like another project in like the Argo ecosystem called Argo CD. Oh. So it, it, it's it, it's all about sort of um, um, sort of GitOps and sort of syncing things from a sort of source control onto the cluster. Okay, okay, not as a pipeline. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's, but it is actually confusing because I actually when I created this slide, I couldn't find. Uh, there isn't any uh, logo for Argo CD, so I just stole the um, actual Argo logo. So this is why, uh, like exactly what you said happens, people think it's just Argo. Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. Uh, so I think the Argo CD people need to get a logo. Um, so yeah, some sort of final um, uh, points. So some of the things we're looking at, so, so GPU sharing is, comes up quite a lot in terms of, you know, because you've got these very costly um, GPUs and you might have so with some of our partners like um, so Bloomberg and um, KF Serving, you've got thousands of models which are 
say very slightly different and then all um, Skykit learn model say or something and, they, and what they need to do is really share on a single server all those models to sort of decrease cost and also some of them might not be used, be used very much. So that's a definitely a challenge. And actually part of the care of survey project, we're looking at um, extension of that project to do some multi-model serving is what we call it, to allow you to have multiple models on a server and sort of pack them in um, to one server. Um, and obviously there's other things we're looking at like Volcano, which has a GPU scheduler to allow you to share GPUs and stuff. So that's very early stages. And I think the actual Volcano GPU schedule is also very much in alpha. So there's interesting stuff there that are coming back from our customers that we need to look at. Um, stuff like Edge. Um, so as like a company and also the code that you've seen, we're not really sort of edge focused at the moment, but that's definitely a area which, which obviously we all know is growing and um, it'd be great to get your feedback on what you're seeing uh, from other people who probably presented. Because I saw you had some sort of cube edge presenting some weeks ago. So it'd be interesting to get your feedback on that point actually rather than me. I think we're, we've certainly seen customers um, in that area, definitely. Um, and so sort of general sort of model optimizations is something we're, we're looking at into the future. So, you know, so customers will sometimes want to just give us the model. It could be just a TensorFlow model, but then we can do various optimizations, optimize it for various endpoints. It could be for edge, you know, sort of, and, or, or other ways of optimizing the model, you know, perhaps take a SkyKit layer model and turn it into one that can be run on a GPU and stuff. And so there's lots of interesting stuff there that we're, we're looking at. And then just one uh, final thing is to shout out about care of serving and sort of general machine learning data plane we're doing. So as you said, we created a general um, uh, machine learning protocol uh, which was uh, is then going to be supported by various people in the industry. So it's supported by NVIDIA, Triton Inference Server, a present self in itself, Care Serving, and, and then hopefully in the near future, Torch Server with Facebook doing some work there. So that's an interesting development. Uh, cool. So hopefully I haven't taken up too much time. It's probably longer than I thought, but yeah, happy to open up a discussion or any points. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It's it's very interesting um, space, and then yeah, in yeah, I think a lot of a lot of people are, are moving more towards um, you know having more of, of a CI/CD type of system where you can have like um, you know have the data scientists create some of these models and uh, have some of the the maybe cluster operators or the DevOps. Uh, uh, people in an organization handle some of the serving parts. So, so I think this kind of fits in, in there to, to fill that gap. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think there's it, it quite a big need, definitely. It's ho hopefully like the slides at the start showed. Um, so yeah, definitely. So what question that, that I have that I, it, it's a seldom team um, looking at maybe having one of their projects join the CNCF for uh, being part of the CNCF. Uh. Uh, yeah, I'm mean, certainly we are um, thinking about it um, in terms of several projects. Probably can't say which, but yeah, we're certainly in talks with CNCF and the guys at um, LFAI. Um, so yeah, um, I think that is probably a direction we'll probably think about uh, for some of the projects. Definitely. Great. Anybody has any questions? I don't want to be the only ones to ask most of the questions. I guess I had a question about the KF serving. It's part of Kubeflow. Is yeah. There are other uh, components that are also part of Kubeflow, or is that that is? I, I somehow had the idea that all of Selden was in Kubeflow, but I guess that's not. That's are all the open source parts. I guess that's not right. Yeah. Yeah. So Selden is like separate from Kubeflow, but we have integrations in Kubeflow. So if people want to use Selden Core in Kubeflow, they can. And also the, the project KF serving is actually in Qflow. So yeah, so it's a bit confusing. So, so, uh, um, so KF serving is part of the Qflow uh, sort of domain and that project is inside um, Qflow for serving. So okay. it's sort of both of the two projects. One is outside, but you can use it and one's inside being developed on there. So if um, Selden became part of CNCF, then Qflow might do that separately and they just interact together. That would be the way to do that. Um, yeah, I suppose it's quite separate. I suppose Qflow, because it's so under uh, so Google, I think probably it's up to them. I think there's actually an open discussion in, in Qflow of, of how the individual projects, whether um, what the governance would be, whether individual projects could then move into CNCF or LFAI 
or how that would, but I think um, Google is interested in keeping it together at the moment. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we, we, I think uh, with Cube Edge, is, there's also a good fit there. Uh, you can maybe Cube Edge can be used to, you know, manage some of these uh, workloads, and then you know, some of them can be used maybe to send the these um, workloads or or the or the models and the the serving mechanism over to the Edge, right? Where maybe you want to have faster response time and I've seen mm. some of the use cases where you know you you do some of that uh, uh, inference uh, on say stop sign or or maybe license plates and uh, mm -hmm. at a at a toll booth for example right so yeah yeah absolutely I mean it's it's not a um, uh, product I know too much about Cube Edge but it's something as part of our sort of research path to see how we can get closer to those guys and see how we can collaborate. Any other comments, questions? Once, twice, got some people on the call that are very quiet. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, okay, no, thank thanks. You, thanks, sir, all the insights and yeah uh, um, let's keep in touch absolutely absolutely yeah thanks for having me here appreciate yeah. it all right thank you all